Let's take a look at unit conversions and dimensional analysis today. Simple problem for you. We're going to convert 100 kilometers per hour to meters per second. But we're going to proceed in a very systematic way, which I and many other people like to call dimensional analysis. Now, I'm going to write down my conversion factors that I might use in this problem. So I've got some kilometers, I've got some meters, and I know that 1,000 meters is equal to 1 kilometer. And then I've got some time units of hours and some time units of seconds. So I, I know that 60 minutes is equal to one hour. And I also know that 60 seconds is equal to one minute. So let's see if we can use those conversion factors to solve this problem in a very systematic way. So I'm going to start out with, by writing what I'm starting with, which is 100 kilometers per hour. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is say to myself, well, I want to end up not in kilometers, but in meters. I want to end up with a meter in the numerator. And I want to get rid of that kilometer in the denominator. So I want to be able to cancel out those kilometers. I'll get meters per hour. Not quite what I want, but I'm a step closer. Now, whenever I multiply, see, I'm not supposed to change the value of that 100 kilometers per hour. I'm only supposed to convert it. And if I multiply by something that has a value of 1, I don't change the value. And anything with a numerator equal to the denominator really has a value of 1. So I know that 1,000 meters is equal to 1 kilometer. In other words, my numerator here is equal to my denominator here, and therefore I'm multiplying by 1. I'm not changing the value. Now, I said we wanted to get rid of the hours. The hours are in the denominator. And so what I want is to put an hour in the numerator. And I know that one hour is worth 60 minutes. And now the hours are going to cancel out. I'm going to be left with meters per minute. Not quite what I want, but once again, I'm a step closer. In my final step here, I'm going to get rid of those minutes by putting a minute up here in the numerator. And of course, I want a second in the denominator. And then, of course, my denominator, 60 seconds, has to equal my numerator, one minute. So what I'm going to get here, when everything's done, is units of meters per second. And I'm just going to multiply 100, that's in the numerator, times 1,000, that's in the numerator as well, divide it by 60, since that's in a denominator, and divide it by 60 again. And if I do that, I get an answer of 27.8 meters per second. Here's a second example involving an alien planet. And on that planet, the units for energy are the ooze. Turns out an ooze is equal to three calories. And the unit for, and one of the time units is the ah, and it's equal to 12.56 seconds. So we're asked to show that one watt is equal to one ooze per ah. So let's see if we can do that. So we want to begin with 1 watt, which is 1 joule per second. And then we want to start getting rid of those earthly units and move into the alien units. So let's do the time unit first. We're going to get rid of those seconds and switch to ahs. So here's our conversion. 1 ah is equal to 12.56 seconds. So now we got rid of the seconds. We've now got joules per ah. Let's now get rid of the joules, but first we're going to have to convert to calories because our conversion factor to the alien units is into calories. So we'll put the joules on the bottom, the calories on the top, and we know that 4.186 joules is exactly one calorie. Now we've got rid of those joules, and now we've got calories per A. Ah. Let's get rid of the calories. We'll put the calories in the denominator, and that'll put the oohs in the numerator. And we know that one ooh is three calories. So now we've got, what, 12.56 on the top, and we've got 4.186 times three on the bottom. Our units are oohs per A. Ah. And when we do the division there, we get one ooh per A. Ah is exactly equivalent to one watt. 
Here's a bit of data from a question taken from an IB exam. It's from the Power, Energy, and Climate Change Unit. Now, that unit, most teachers choose to kind of speed through it. The IB syllabus is very cram-packed, so we're very, very time-crunched. So most teachers will move very quickly through that unit. Now, in that particular unit, something that can be very, very helpful is dimensional analysis. In fact, there's no other unit where I'd say dimensional analysis is as useful as it is in power, energy, and climate change. And the first thing you need to realize is that when you've got per unit quantities, they become like conversion factors. And we need those conversion factors in order to do dimensional analysis. So let me show you what I mean. Density of a, of a fuel, that's a per unit quantity because it tells you the number of kilograms per meter cubed. The IB writes that as meters to the minus three, but this is kilograms per meter cubed. So what that tells us is that 8.0 times 10 squared, that is 800 kilograms, is equivalent to one meter cubed for that particular substance. This here, it doesn't look like it's a per unit quantity, but you notice here it's energy produced by one meter cubed of the liquid fuel. So it really is a conversion factor here. We can say that 2.7 times 10 to the 10th joules has to be equivalent to one meter cubed. Grams per second. That means that 0 0.13 grams of that fuel is going to be consumed each second. So those two are effectively equivalent to one another. Latent heat of vaporization, 290 kilojoules. That much heat has to be absorbed by one kilogram. So those all become like conversion factors and we can do our dimensional analysis. Okay, so here is that original IB, power, energy, and climate change question. And I think it's a question that can be done without ever having studied the topic, if you, you, know, if you know how to do dimensional analysis well. So let's work through this example. What I'd like you to do is read over the question, try it out for yourself, and then come back for my response. Okay, so we're looking for the power produced, and of course the units for power are the watts, and watts are joules per second. So what we're going to try to do is work out our units so we end up with joules per second. Now our energy is coming from this fuel here, so I'm going to start with this term. And as I said earlier, that really means that we've got 2.7 times 10 to the 10th joules per meter cubed. Now, I'm going to want to go from meter cubed units into mass units because I can see I've got mass per second here. So ultimately, I want to go to joules per second. But let's get rid of the meters cubed and put that into mass units. So that's where I need my density, right here. So let's get rid of the meters cubed and go to kilograms. And we know that 800 kilograms is worth one meter cubed. So now we've got joules per kilogram. Now what we really want to do is go to joules per second. And here we can see that conversion factor between mass units and second units. But let's convert first to grams. So we, we're going to get rid of the kilograms and convert to grams. And we know that there's a thousand grams in one kilogram. So now I've got joules per gram. Now we can use this, this particular conversion factor and we're going to get rid of the grams and go to seconds. And we know here that 0 0.13 grams is equivalent to one second. So the grams will cancel out and you'll notice here that I'm going to end up with my units of joules per second. And that's what I need. So if I work this out now I get a value of 4387.5 joules per second or about 4.4 kilowatts. Here's a thermal physics question. But I don't think you need a lot of thermal physics background to do this question. I think if you're good with dimensional analysis and understanding your units, and you know a little bit about the law of conservation of energy, then you can do this problem without a solid background in thermal physics. So let's set up the problem. We've got a piece of metal in a flame, 
and they're going to be in equilibrium with each other so the temperature of the flame will equal the temperature of the metal and that's T and that's what we want to solve for. Now when we very quickly take that metal, throw it in, the water heats up and it changes its temperature from 288 all the way up to 353. Now it's in a calorimeter and the calorimeter is a good thermal conductor so it always takes on exactly the same temperature as the water. So whatever change in temperature the water goes through, the calorimeter as well goes through the same temperature change. Now if we think about energy conservation, we can say that the energy lost by that metal is going to be gained by the water and the calorimeter. And assuming that there's no heat losses to the environment, those two should end up being equal to one another. So what I'd like you to do now is to look carefully at these values here, look at their units, see if you can work out this problem without a background in thermal physics. Okay, let's look at this first data value. The heat capacity of the metal is 82.7 joules per Kelvin. So we have a unit quantity here. We know that 82.7 joules is equivalent to 1 degree Kelvin. That is when you add or subtract 82.7 joules from the metal, it'll change its temperature by 1 degree. So what we need to do, if we want to find out the number of joules, we've got to take that 82.7 joules per Kelvin and multiply it by the temperature change. Now it's going to start at a temperature of T and it's going to end up at 353. So the temperature change would be T minus 353 and that is in Kelvin so the Kelvins are going to cancel out here and we'll be left with joules of energy. And that's what we want if we're going to have the law of conservation of energy. Now on the other side of the equation we can do exactly the same thing with the water and the calorimeter. The water it has a heat capacity of 546 joules per Kelvin. And it goes through a change in temperature from 288 to 353. That's a difference of 65 degrees. So we're going to put in a 65 Kelvin here. Once again, the Kelvins cancel out. We'll be left with joules of energy. And then a little bit of that energy goes into the calorimeter itself. It's going to be 54.6 joules per degree Kelvin times its temperature change which is also 65 degrees Kelvin. So now we can multiply all this out. We're going to get 82.7 times the temperature T here minus 353 times 82.7 which comes out to be 29193 and then on the other side of the equation we multiply these two numbers together we get 35490 and 65 times 54.6 is 3549. So now we can solve for T. We're going to have to add the 35,000 plus the 3500 plus the 29,000 and we'll get 68,232 and then we've got to divide that by 82.7 and if we do that we should get an answer of 825 degrees Kelvin. So the temperature of that flame, or the original temperature of the metal, is going to be 825 degrees Kelvin. Okay, here's a second problem. This is from mechanics, and students had quite a bit of difficulty with it. It has to do with force and momentum. What I'd like you to do is to read over the question, try it out for yourself, but this time, maybe without thinking too much about the physics, concentrate more on the units. We can always look at the physics afterwards, but right now I want to concentrate on dimensional analysis. So let's start with the, the first question here. Deduce that the volume of the water ejected per second through the nozzle is 1.1 times 10 to the minus 4 meters cubed. So the units that we're looking for are meters cubed every second, per second and meters cubed. Now we've certainly got a number here that's meters per second we've got this number 18 meters per second. So if we're able to multiply that by meters squared, we'd get meters cubed per second. And of course the cross-sectional radius is going to be a meter squared. It's going to be an area. So if I put that in as 1.4 times 10 to the minus 3 meters all squared, this is going to be the formula pi r squared for area, I'll get 
18 meters per second times pi times meters squared. So I get meters cubed per second. If I multiply that out, I get an answer of 1.1 times 10 to the minus 4 meters cubed every second. And that is the rate at which the volume of water is ejected from the rocket ship. So that's part A. Now part B, you're going to be asked for the force. Now force is newtons, and a newton going to fundamental units is kilograms times meters per second squared. It's mass times acceleration units. Now right here I've got something that involves mass. I've got this thousand kilograms per meter cubed. And from the previous part A, I also have this 1.1 times 10 to the minus 4 meters cubed per second. So now you can see I'd, I'd be getting kilograms per second. So uh, all I need now is to multiply by meters per second and I'd get my kilograms times meters per second squared. So the meters per second that I have is this speed here. So I'm going to multiply it by 18 meters per second. So what you're going to get here in the end is the kilograms on the top, a meter in the numerator, and a second, and another second, so second squared in the bottom. So if we multiply all that out, we get an answer of 2 kilograms times meters per second squared. And of course, that's equal to 2 newtons. Now, it might seem a little strange to do it that way, but doing it that way might lead to the physics that we need. You might remember that the defining equation for Newton's second law, written in terms of momentum, is F equals delta P over delta T. And in this case here, we don't have a changing velocity, we have a changing mass. So we can write this as delta MV over delta T, and I can take the V outside because it's constant. So we've really got V times delta M over delta T times the rate of change of mass. And, and when we multiplied these two together, we were really getting that delta M over delta T. That's the rate of change of mass, kilograms per second and then we multiplied it by the speed, the 18 meters per second, to get this answer of 2 newtons. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.